I think all sensible people have the British Constitution as one of their hobbies. It is the most interesting uh, matter to, to discuss and be informed about. As Dicey said, Dicey argued, it is Parliament that is the defender of the liberties of the people, of our ancient constitution and of our freedoms. I, I give way. Hello, this is Jacob Rees-Mogg. In the first series of this podcast, I spoke to a number of leading constitutionalists and Westminster insiders to explore their views on why Parliament works, both in terms of why it matters that Parliament works hard to deliver for the people, and also in terms of why Parliament is so effective in doing just that. I was able to draw on all of these illuminating discussions when I was asked to give the Study of Parliament Group's Wheeler Booth Memorial Lecture at its annual conference in early January 2021. This was an opportunity for me to attempt to frame all that I had heard from the first series in a new way, and there was so much to draw from. And Parliament is, of course, at the centre of our constitutional arrangements. Not that Parliament governs, it can't do that, 650 MPs can't govern, but it holds government to account. Our parliamentary work is uh, fuelled by our constituents, and that's absolutely as it should be. I mean, I've always been very proud of the way that, that uh, British politics relies on the fact, is absolutely connected to the fact that, that we represent our constituents. I, I do it for a purpose. I do it to help the constituents, and I hope that the answers that they get will help them. Now, we probably have to progress those answers uh, a wee bit more afterwards, and we're quite happy to do that. You know, those people on the other side of the chamber, they're not your enemies. They are fellow parliamentarians, and they're also just trying to do the best that they can. As Parliamentary Council, you can be drafting tax law one year, criminal law the next year, and um, that's a really fascinating aspect of the job. It's a privilege. Sometimes you will have um, informal meetings, ministers will call a meeting, invite members with an interest in the bill to come and discuss it before the bill comes in, and I think that's extremely valuable. All of us have had a different role to play than we expected, and we've all pulled together because we all believe in one thing, that's this house and the future of democracy. I'm extremely grateful to all those you heard there. Vernon Bogdaner, Chloe Smith, Jim Shannon, Natasha Engel, Elizabeth Gardner, Philip Norton, and of course the inimitable Mr Speaker himself, Sir Lindsay Hoyle. Their perspectives have all helped provide answers to the question of why Parliament works. And in this podcast's second series, I'm going to attempt my own answer, exploring some of the different elements of my lecture to the study of Parliament Group in more detail. I shall do so by talking to historians and politicians alike about the links that can be traced between the UK Parliament's historical development and its present-day practices, and trying to unpick what I mean when I talk about the dark matter of the UK Parliament, the unseen that is more, not less, democratic than you think. But before beginning these interviews, this first episode of Series 2 consists of the lecture itself, with an introduction by Lord Norton, I hope you enjoy it. To give the lecture, we're delighted to welcome uh, the Lord President of the Council and Leader of the House of Commons, uh, the Right Honourable uh, Jacob rees Mogg. Educated at Trinity College, Oxford, he made a career in business before being elected Conservative MP for North East Somerset in 2010. He quickly established a reputation as an effective debater, members coming into the chamber to listen to him when he spoke as well as an independent-minded backbencher, variously ignoring the blandishments of the whips. His rebellions included, included voting against the Fixed-Term Parliaments Bill. He also uh, chaired the European Research Group and was an opponent of Theresa May's Chequers deal. In 2019, he was appointed Lord President of the Council and Leader of the House of Commons, and as such, he follows a distinguished line of leaders of the House who have addressed the Study of Parliament Group annual conference. And uh, it gives me great pleasure to invite the leader to speak this evening. Well, um, thank you very much for that flattering introduction, which I'm very grateful for, uh, and indeed for giving me the opportunity to address the Study of Parliament Group in these unusual circumstances. I'm sorry that we're not able to meet personally. Um, I'm actually speaking 
uh, from my home in Somerset. So if there are odd noises off from children and so on, uh, you will, I hope, forgive me. I'm not sure what uh, Sir Michael Wheeler Booth would have thought of the circumstances under which we're meeting. But I think his thoughts on the virtual parliament of 2020 would have been very interesting. Um, I should try to honour his memory by offering some reflections of my own on the government's role in the legislature with the various um, paraphernalia, as you can see behind me, uh, of a childhood home. Um, my contention this evening in, is that our constitution is the thing that makes us prosperous and the returning powers to Westminster from Europe will boost our economic growth. But explaining why our nation has been so successful over the centuries relies first on recognizing the existence and then identifying the nature of an unseen dark matter which lies at the heart of British governance. I fear this missing link, the secret ingredient, has not received sufficient acknowledgement despite its presence being detected by many members of the study of Parliament group over the years. I will also try to help rebut Lord Helsham's assertion that governments in Britain tend towards undermining Parliament to the benefit of the executive through what he called an elective dictatorship. Many commentators have come to use the phrase elective dictatorship as shorthand for an overbearing administration and the inevitable criticisms of Standing Order 14, which follow. Tonight, I aim to demonstrate that the fundamentals which underpin our system of governance and have developed over many centuries, both explain our success as a nation and provide reassurance that the right balance continues to be stuck between the executive and the legislature today. Ours is an uncodified constitution supported by four pillars, freedom of speech, rights of property, the rule of law, and of course, democracy. Together, they have created the stable conditions necessary for economic growth and ultimately prosperity over a prolonged period. In the 1960s, some people wondered if the Soviet Union would continue to conti on its successful, viable economic path after it had had three decades of remarkable economic growth. But its achievements proved illusory, and other countries, which are dismissive of the four pillars, are likely to encounter and have tended to encounter similar fates. This is because economies ultimately suffer when they become dominated by the extractive institutions described so well by Daron Asimoglu and James A. Robinson in their influential book, Why Nations Fail. It, it's recognized as a seminal text on modern governance theory, and it is no surprise they cite the United Kingdom as an example of a place where inclusive political institutions helped promote growth. Asimoglu and Robinson described a virtuous circle of positive reinforcement in which broadening democratic rights pave the way for a more equal distribution of income and vice versa. Their narrative is punctuated by the Glorious Revolution, the Black Act and the Great Reform Act, but I'm inclined to go back much further to the medieval parliament and a moment in the 13th century when the crown was forced to turn its back on an extractive approach for good. I refer not to Magna Carta, which merely saw King John bowing to the barons, but rather to the 1297 statute concerning tallage. Sparing you the original version, the act in full reads as follows. No tallage or aid shall be taken or levied by us or our heirs in our realm without the goodwill and assent of archbishops, bishops, earls, barons, knights, burgesses, and other freemen of the land. The United Kingdom's 21st century constitution can directly trace its commitment to the concept of consent from the people back to 1297. It represents recognition by the executive that measures cannot be imposed on the people without their assent through Parliament. During the Wars of the Roses, this idea was brilliantly articulated by Sir John Fortescue. He argued that England was more prosperous than France because France was governed by a dominium regale in which the French king had the power simply to take the produce of the poor French farmers. By contrast, if the king of England were to attempt a similar maneuver against an English farmer, the English farmer would have recourse to the courts, including the High Court of Parliament. As Sir John explained, the English king is under the law, just like everyone else, and must, as he puts it, 
in his commendation of the laws of England, take away none of his subjects' goods without due satisfaction for the same. He continues, neither does the king bear, either by himself or by his servants and officers, levy upon his subjects tallages, subsidies, or any other burdens, or alter their laws, or make new laws, without the expressed consent and agreement of his whole realm in Parliament. Wherefore, every inhabitor of that realm bless and enjoyeth at his pleasure all the fruits that his land or cattle beareth, with all the profits and commodities which by his own travail or by the labour of others be gaineth by land, by water, not hindered by the injury or wrong detainment of any man, but that he shall be allowed a reasonable recompense. England, he concluded, is governed by a dominium politicum et regale. Unlike the absolute monarchy of the French, undoubtedly an extractive institution, the limited monarchy Sir John described in the 15th century, an inclusive institution, created the space for a bottom-up approach um, also seen in our legal traditions. We can see the same divergence between English legal systems and those on the continent. The difference between the common law and its underlying assumption that everything not expressly forbidden is allowed, and the emphasis on civil law so often seen on the continent, which more often than not tended towards the prescriptive. We have, of course, entered a new chapter of renewed cooperation with our European friends and neighbours. So I want to emphasise that the continental model has itself been successful. It could indeed be argued that Louis XIV was laying the foundations for France's station as a fashion powerhouse by mandating that new textiles appear every six months. And like Bertie Worcester, I appreciate the importance of being suitably dressed and so will not dispute the importance of a 3,000 livre fine for anyone daring to wear Venetian or Flemish lace in 17th century France. Louis finance minister, Jean-Baptiste Colbert, certainly valued fashion as a serious business, declaring in 1665 that it was to France as the gold mines of Peru were to Spain. But it says so much about the European approach to regulation that two thirds of the roughly 200 directives introduced by Colbert concerned the textile industry. Such a highly regimented approach did have its downsides, however, with many finding ways around them to try, around those trying to enforce the rules. Um, the outlook, this approach did not provide for the English model of innovation because innovation comes from doing things you are not allowed to do. When the government does wish to take powers through statute, it can only do so in accordance with the statute concerning tallage. That is, with the consent of the freemen of the land, these days in the form of the elected House of Commons and the appointed House of Lords. And I can provide no better example of the enduring value of this modus operandi than the extraordinary regulations currently in force respecting the coronavirus. Public acceptance of the great restrictions imposed on their liberty has to my mind undoubtedly been helped by Parliament's acceptance of them. The political nation, the nation as a whole, has bought into the regulations. This is political consent with a, a dominium politicum et regale, and it makes government possible. The alternative, of course, is Chairman Mao's dictum that every communist must grasp the truth, the political power grows out of the barrel of a gun, not in the United Kingdom, not in a parliamentary democracy where political power grows out of the ability first to represent and then to deliver on behalf of broad sections of society. Delivering for the people was as important to those attending parliament in the early 14th century as it is today. During the reign of Edward I, the occasion of a parliament had become a great opportunity for those seeking favour justice or address through petitioning. And by 1311, the right of private individuals to seek redress had become such an intrinsic part of what it was to be a parliament that petitions found their way into the new ordinances imposed on Edward II. Since then, the modes of seeking redress of grievance have steadily evolved. From the increasingly obsequious language used to address the king from the late 14th century, all the way through to the present day use of e-petitions which has seen millions help influence parliamentary business at the click of a mouse and through it, government policy. Our modern framework 
preserves the work of representation through constituency casework, a vital tool for building confidence in our democracy. Before I was first elected to Parliament, I did not anticipate just how effective the platform of being an MP would prove in tackling the many and very difficult circumstances faced by constituents. Whether what is at stake is a license to drive a bus or a life-saving drug, a bogus educational course or a constituent's access to benefits, every successful case shows that the system continues to work, redress of grievance is still achieved. And as with the individual, so with the collective. By Edward II's reign, the Commons was petitioning on what we may today call policies of national rather than local significance through common rather than private petitions. As the King's responses became the basis of new law, the legislative and the representational were becoming increasingly intertwined. In the 14th century, thinkers were already recognizing the importance of consent for the good governance of the nation as a whole. At the same time, notions of kingship were developing into the 15th century, which required the monarch to prevent himself as a beneficent actor dedicated to improving the common weal. One does not need to sign up to the Whiggish determinism to trace a path from the collective petitioning on national issues of the late medieval period to the modern day party manifestos. Today, we prepare for a new parliament by offering voters an integrated and rounded package of policy proposals. We then use parliament to deliver for the electorate by implementing the policies they voted for including through legislation. The 2019 general election, for example, was fought largely on whether or not we needed to get Brexit done. Voters spoke and we have duly left the European Union, much like an early 14th century petition leading to legislation. With that out of the way, attention now turns to a second session in which the government aims to help the economy build back better. The, this matters because the parliament begins after a general election, but also concludes just before the next one. As St. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 9, 19, though I am free from all, I have made myself a servant to all that I might win more of them. Concept of service through politics. But to put it more bluntly, boosting businesses through build back better bills will bring blessings from the burghers in their boroughs blissfully buttressing backbenchers to boot. But what if, as we have seen in two of the last four general elections, no party wins an overall majority in the Commons? Governments, in a hung parliament scenario, were actually the real target of Lord Hailsham's elective dictatorship complaint. Lord Hailsham was speaking, as a Conservative, of course, in 1976, at a time when the ability to manoeuvre of the Labour government, then in power, was severely restricted by its dwindling majority. So he was understandably unhappy with the proposition that a struggling administration with an uncertain hold over the Commons could nonetheless control the business of the House and deploy the various prerogatives of the executive. Nevertheless, Lord Hailsham seemed to have forgotten the statute concerning tallage. Though in reality, I forget, doubt Lord Hailsham ever forgot anything, but um, it will allow me that assumption for the purpose of this speech and everything that flowed henceforth that this is a nation governed with the consent of the people through parliament, and that the art of governing is conducted not through the barrel of a gun, but through political discussion and debate. Fortescue's dominium politicum et regale. What is possible in a hung parliament is patently different to what is possible with a majority of 80. And if government is the art of the possible, then it is in parliament where the possible is divined. Through the continuous interplay between the executive and the legislature, ministers engaging in open, constructive fashion with parliamentarians and MPs and peers, drawing on their views and those of their constituents and their accumulated expertise to determine what they are and are not prepared to support. Some of this interaction happens on the floor of the House and through Parliament's formal channels, written questions, correspondence, select committee appearances. And if that were really all there were to our parliamentary democracy, some of Lord Hailsham's cavils might be valid. But there is something missing, which happens long before votes take place in the Commons. Our equations calculating why the UK Constitution is such a success 
will only add up if we include that mysterious dark matter mentioned earlier. But before I give the game away completely, I've just observed that the Palace of Westminster itself offers a clue. Like a theatre or a television studio, it is divided into parts intended to be visible and the parts intended to be invisible. Its principal floor is designed to be seen and admired from its blended depictions of Magna Carta, the Armada, the Civil War, Trafalgar and Waterloo, to its mint and encaustic tiles and marble busts. This is the Palace of Westminster as seen on tours and as seen on TV. What a contrast with the ground floor. Its network of rather prosaic courtyards and corridors is somewhat more utilitarian. You might say that one floor is dignified and the other efficient, to paraphrase Walter Badgett. But the Commons Chamber could not function without the engine room below. The doorkeepers need to be fed. Members need their hair cut. The peers need their shooting range, or at least they're still assigned to it, even if the range itself is no longer there. And what of the people walking about the corridors of the palace? Members of parliament, lobby journalists, ministers who appear on our television screens to argue their points in the nation's living rooms. They walk the same corridors as those whose silent, unseen function is to support their work. House staff, civil servants, members staff. Everyone who works in parliament helps make it work as an institution. But the contributions of those out of the public eye is often overlooked. The clerks, whose scholarly advice helps guide members' procedural peccadilloes in the right direction. The Office of Parliamentary Council, who worked all over Christmas with their lawyers crafting government bills at considerable speed. The civil servants across Whitehall, who work on parliamentary business. And no doubt, Sir Michael Wheeler Booth would have told us a thing or two about the backroom work involved in keeping the Lords up and running. Still... This work does not fully account for the dark matter I have been alluding to. The toil of officials is important only because of what it enables, namely the hidden considerations of government about how to handle parliament. This is the dark matter of governance. It is less measurable than the visible and, harder, and it is harder for observers to discern. It rarely gets talks, talked about and so its importance is undervalued. But without it, government could never identify what is possible and what is not, which of its desired policies the parliament will support and which it must quietly shelve. When to concede a policy during the delicate choreography of a bill's passage through parliament, what political battles to stand and fight on, and which are best left to another day. For much of the 18 months that I have chaired the cabinet's parliamentary business and legislation committee, what has surprised me most is the amount of time devoted to parliamentary handling. The idea that the Prime Minister wakes up in the morning and says, I should like a bill, and then Downing Street tells the Commons to get on with it, is simply wrong. There is a careful process discussing how government policy can be implemented with maximum support. By its very nature, this democratic and consensual work is hidden. If the measures under consideration are not judged to be sufficiently supported in Parliament, they will not see the light of day. Although a bill once introduced will not be amended too many times without the blessing of the government, that bill will not be introduced by ministers until the business managers think it will be a passable piece of legislation. The permanent membership of the PBL committee, the Commons and Lords leaders, and the chief whips of both houses act as a safety valve with this regard. They are there to say, Members, peers won't wear this if they are sceptical about a policy's popularity in Parliament. The unseen is a protection. The unseen is more democratic than you might think, not less. And among those who have appreciated the value of informal spaces within Westminster is the very, very distinguished chairman of uh, this evening's session, Lord Norton of Louth, who, as both academic and parliamentarian, has a deep I think it's fair to say, unique understanding of how Parliament works, if I am for once allowed to use the word unique, which is normally frowned upon in polite society. Perhaps with his forbearance, I might take the liberty of quoting a section of his remarks on the Why Parliament Works podcast, available now from all good podcast providers, when Lord Norton joined me for a very interesting and illuminating conversation. He said, you don't always appreciate the influence that members are having 
All you see on the record are usually government amendments, which are the ones that dominate at report stage. So you think it's wholly executive driven, and it's not. It's actually a symbol of parliamentary influence that ministers are responding to what members are saying. And I could not agree more. Uh, Lord Norton goes on to point out that this process is strengthened still further by the fact that Parliament is an open institution in which members are hearing from outside voices affected by the legislation. It's entirely in the tradition of Parliament throughout its history that this should happen. And it is far from the monolithic, blunt instrument of Lord Hailsham's uncomfortable vision. One problem with the virtual proceedings is that while the proceedings of the House or both houses are able to continue. Indeed, in 2020, the Commons sat in more weeks than in any year in the preceding decade. The hidden aspects of Parliament's work have become much more difficult, not to say impossible. Nevertheless, despite these temporary restrictions, Parliament matters today for the same reason as it has ever since 1297, as a place for the executive to seek approval for its measures and the people's representatives. For the first time in many years, it will be able to do so once again in 2021 across a full swathe of policy. This is good news for Parliament as an institution. We will once again conform to the three principles of parliamentary sovereignty set out by A.B. Dicey, that great constitutional theorist, that Parliament is the supreme lawmaking body and can enact laws on any subject, that Parliament cannot bind its successor, and that no court of law or other body for that matter can question the validity of Parliament's enactments. During our membership of the EU, its institutions were certainly able to question the validity of our enactments. We had in practice restricted our ability to pass laws. Power had fled away from the British people and with it the decision-making process became even less visible. Parliament's light had become dimmed under the European bushel, but no more. Regardless of your views on Brexit, it is clear that its central implication for Westminster is that Parliament now has the opportunity to shine more brightly than ever before. This will not happen without the kind of unseen work which Westminster has always relied on. So my New Year's resolution is to encourage MPs to raise their collective game in order to respond to the new enhanced importance of their roles. For at no time since 1973 have MPs had the prospect of legislating on large swathes of policy areas which had previously been determined in Brussels, some of which required no further legislation in our Parliament. Nor has the writing of legislation been so important, because so many more policy areas, particularly those subject to secondary legislation, will now be subject potentially to judicial review. From sovereignty flows accountability. It will be Parliament rather than the Council of Europe, which will give its voice on its policy wishes. Ministers will therefore naturally want to spend more time in Westminster and feed Parliament more red meat. Parliamentary handling will become more important in every way. This is in the best interests of the British people and therefore of the government, because better scrutiny always leads to better policy. The Commons as an institution needs to recognise that it is through legislation that MPs can best deliver for the British people. On this basis, all those who work in Parliament may wish to consider how they may rethink their activity to ensure it is effective as it can possibly be, to allow it to conduct scrutiny in ways fit for 2021, not 2001, or even 2011. Never will the Westminster Parliament have been more visible, but never can we have had an opportunity quite like this to show what we can do as lawmakers to improve the lives of those we represent. In a dominium politicum et regali, which thanks to the unseen work of thousands of hardworking officials in Westminster and Whitehall, gives the people's elected representatives the chance to reinvigorate our parliament. So that by the time of the 50th anniversary of the study of parliament group, now just three years away, it will have become clear that the great benefits of our constitution fully realised through parliamentary sovereignty, restored once more, are enabling us to build back better towards a more prosperous, fairer, more just United Kingdom. And I have this great book from uh, Sir John Fortescue, which I think is published, it's the second edition, published in 1573, which has been 
a very helpful part of my text to show that I really am a modern cutting edge parliamentarian. But to finish with him, and hereby it cometh to pass, read Sir John Fortescue, that the men of the land are rich, having abundance of gold and silver and other things necessary for the maintenance of man's life. They eat plentifully of all kinds of flesh and fish. They wear fine woolen cloth in their apparel. This is the opportunity we have with effective parliamentary scrutiny, democratic accountability, and an understanding that we are a dominium politicum et regales. Thank you very much, and I'm now willing to take any questions you want to ask.